festival dedicated to many-sided human potential and exploring complex problems through an interdisciplinary lens. Now, we've got a very special guest uh, here today. My name is Wakas. I'm not the special guest. Uh, I'm the founder of the Da Vinci Network and curator of the Polymath Festival. But the special guest is Professor Herminia Abara, professor at the London Business School. And she is a world expert, a global thought leader on uh, career reinvention, on career change. She's written many articles, many books uh, on the topic, given many lectures on the topic uh, around the world. And she is author of Working Identity, uh, a special book that explores this subject at great length. And so um, it's fair to say that this particular subject of career reinvention or professional reinvention, uh, because we do live in precarious times. Of course, not just the pandemic, before the pandemic, we already had these questions. And of course, the Working Identity book was published well before. Uh, and many of these questions about career, career paths, um, how does one reinvent themselves in, in, in uh, difficult circumstances? These have been uh, timeless questions uh, that uh, only a few have come and risen to the challenge of trying to answer uh, effectively. But Herminia has done that very well, and it's uh, been a very, very popular book. And especially now during the pandemic, um, we are ever more uncertain about our careers, about our lives, about how things are going to plan out in the immediate and uh, uh, immediate near and distant futures. So uh, this is a very, very timely discussion for us to have. So without further ado, I'm going to pass on to uh, Herminia Ibarra, who's going to give us a short presentation. Thank you so much, Wakas, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm coming from a gray uh, morning in, in London. So hello, wherever, wherever you are. And indeed, I'm gonna be talking about professional reinvention, a topic I have been looking at for several decades now, and which uh, I have learned has become very salient uh, for many uh, over uh, the past year or so. I'm going to just take a moment to share my screen. I have some slides to share with you, and then we're just going to launch right in. Here we go. So I'm going to take this uh, topic in three parts. I'm going to talk first about the trends that have been accelerating uh, the extent to which people consider and actually engage in changing careers over the last couple of decades. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the process, what it's really like, uh, what it feels like, uh, what the experience is, what the steps are. And then I'm going to end uh, with uh, the tools and, and the few things I have learned you can do if you're engaged in this process to increase the likelihood of a successful reinvention. And then I'll turn it over to you, Waka, so we can engage in a little conversation. So in terms of the trends, there's really been four big trends that have been accelerating the incidence and likelihood of people making pretty big career changes. You know, first of all, we're living longer. Uh, and as we live longer, we want to do different things. You know, the same career, the same work doesn't necessarily have enough novelty, enough challenge, uh, enough interest to carry us through these longer working lives. And of course, as we're living longer, we're also really not retiring or reinventing retiring retirement. And that's a, a career change in and of itself that's quite interesting. So we've got to we've got to reinvent ourselves several times and making transitions in and out of different phases of our lives and careers has become a really important skill to have. Then of course technology. You know technology is facilitating a lot of the things that we do now in our careers. It's disrupting the business models of our organizations, fo forcing some of the kind of restructuring um, that sometimes leaves us with few choices about where to go next. It's making possible gig working of all different kinds. I mean, look at, look at the working from home that we have experienced over the last year. That would not have been possible 20 years ago. So that's really creating opportunities, but also undoing certain kinds of opportunities and undoing certain kinds of career paths. And very related to that is the whole category of changes in how we work, changes in how organizations operate, uh, changes in how they um, organize and streamline corporations restructure all the time. Um, 
they downsize, they upsize, um, they increasingly use contingent workforces. We increasingly work in freelance gig and portfolio kind of careers. So there's a lot of changes in how we work that again are um, leading people to pose themselves questions about what they might be doing and what next. And then, you know, I'm a psychologist, sociologist by training. And one of the things that I found most interesting is really societally, how much we have changed, just even in the span of time since I've been studying careers, what we expect of our jobs, what we expect of our careers has just changed enormously. It's not just a paycheck. It's not just stability. It's not just the blue chip. We want meaning. We want passion. We want balance in our lives. We want to create our own opportunities. And so those are changes too that have been stimulating a move towards what do I want? What kind of career would fulfill me? And then of course, you know, the pandemic kind of came in <laughs> and interacted with all of this. And, and, and part of what's interesting is, you know, it was a shock to the system. It kind of disrupted our habitual routines. You know, in some cases slowed us down, in other cases sped us up. But for many people, at least people I've been talking to, it's created a space to ask the big questions. What matters? What do I want to do? What's worth doing? And, and, and interestingly, it's not, it's not just any shock either. It's a shock that's reminded us of our mortality. You know, many of us have had um, challenging situations with our families, with our friends. And those things, those kinds of experiences also make us stop and say, hey, is what I'm doing worth doing? Is this what I want to occupy myself with? And of course, we've also been less busy, less distracted with the to and fro and flights and this and that. And that also provokes a little bit of thinking. So anyhow, the long and the short of it is all of these factors have been at play for some time in leading people to reconsider careers, to think about reinvention. But I think we've had a real infusion of that over the past year, um, just to share, um, this comes from a survey, this is the only slide I have that looks like this, but it comes from a survey I did in a webinar that had about 5,000 people in it talking about career change about a month ago. And by far the factor that was most important to people across the ages, and it was the only one that was really consistent, no matter if you were in your 20s or in your 60s or anywhere in between, was shifting to have more meaningful work. And that's just an illustration of the trends I've been talking about that have been exacerbated uh, by, uh, by COVID and the pandemic. And so now I want to shift into what I've learned um, in studying this over the last 20 years. And, you know, of course, career changes are very subject to economic circumstances. But I'll tell you, I've been looking at this from you know, the days of the dot-com boom, and then the bust, and then the expansion of the economy. So lots of different cycles. And so I'm going to talk about what's really constant and uniform across ages, across uh, economic cycles. And it really stop, starts with the idea of transition. If you want to understand professional reinvention, you need to understand that it's a transition process. It's not a change, it's a transition. And transition is psychological, it's social, and it's a process of moving away from something that you're quite familiar with without not yet having left it while moving towards something without not yet knowing what it is. That's the magic of it and that's the challenge of it. So just to say a few words about the transition process as I have learned it, I often call this the bad news slide uh, because uh, people don't wanna hear it. People who've gone through it immediately say, yes, this is true. Um, it takes a lot longer than you anticipate. It tends to be messy and nonlinear. It's really hard to plan and analyze your way into it as you would make another kind of big decision or change. It's not a plan and implement. Let me find the answer. You know, I need to know my next career and then just put in the steps, but really much more of an iterative process of experimenting and learning about what you really want, about whether it's feasible, about whether it's attractive, about what you need to do to move into it. And as you take steps, actually, the target changes, the destination changes as you learn. Uh, that's what slows it down. That's what makes it messy. You know, in, in, in the studies I have done, the most common challenge has been people will tell you often, I know exactly what I don't want anymore, what doesn't suit me, what I need to move away from. It's just that I can't pinpoint quite yet what I'd like to do instead. And that's part of what forces what is really a voyage of discovery that is always going to take longer 
than a straight linear process. It's also increasingly what I call under institutionalized, which is a big word to say that there's no set pattern. You're not necessarily, you know, if you're moving from being a lawyer to a winemaker, there's not a set of patterns that, you know, it's not like you take, you go to school, you get this degree, you get an internship, you go through a partnership process. The steps are unclear. There's lots of different possible steps to that destination. You're not necessarily following in the footsteps of somebody who's done it before. So it's a bit of a do it your own kind of, do it yourself kind of quality to it. There aren't lots of vehicles to hold your hand through clear and sequence steps in a process, which makes it harder, but also makes it much more subject to um, tailoring to you, to allowing creativity in the process. I'll just say a little bit about it in terms of beginning, middle, end. Um, in the beginning, and uh, for those of you who are early on and in, in, in kind of embarking on this process, you may see some things that feel familiar. Part of what happens in the beginning is urgency increases. And maybe that's what the pandemic has done for some people. You had a kind of a low simmering sort of dissatisfaction and all of a sudden the urgency, the desire for change starts to take hold. But the thing is, and here, here's what's really critical to provoke or incite action. It's not enough just to move away from something. You need the pull of something new and exciting and interesting to, to help you kind of climb your way out. And part of what happens is that the network around you, your friends and family, particularly if you have a good job, um, you work for a blue chip company, you have a nice resume, they'll tell you you're crazy. Um, they'll tell you not to take the risk. They'll tell you you're safer sticking to where you are, especially in precarious times. And so often we kind of wait for a sign from the gods, you know, the clouds to part, you know, is a headhunter going to come my way and propose something? And those things are never quite right if you're changing careers, because those things are always going to be very close to what you were doing already. That wasn't quite right. And, and jolts and triggers like the pandemic can play a key role in reflection, but they're insufficient if you don't start taking action, if you stay in your head. Because in the beginning, the key thing that is a motor is what psychologists call possible cells. And possible cells are the images you have in your head about a divergent set of possibilities for yourself. I might do this, I should do that, um, I'd love to become this, I fear like hell, turning out like that, all of those images of our possibilities for the future, they're there. And what needs to happen in the beginning to start to increase that urgency and create that pull is to help some of those possible selves come out of your head and into reality by taking on projects, by taking on activities, by talking to people, by telling people about it, by doing things to start to bring them to life. As soon as you do that, as soon as you start bringing those possible selves to life, talking to a hand hunter, interviewing, going on a side project, starting to write a book, anything else that you might do to explore those possibilities, you fall into the terrible middles, the betwixt and between stage of career transition that is necessary, but can be really difficult and unpleasant. It's exciting but it's also really challenging because what starts to happen here, and it has to do with how much the work we do is an anchor for our identities. What starts to happen here is when you're in between the old and new you, you feel rudderless, you feel unmoored, neither here nor there. People report, I don't even know who I am anymore. They report oscillating between kind of holding on, I, you know, I just a few more years and I'll be safe or really letting go and saying, I don't even care if I have another thing on the horizon, this is it, I'm taking the leap. It's a really hard period for the people around you because you're oscillating. And so they wanna save you from yourself and they'll be kind of pulls for conservatism when exactly what you need is a bit of the opposite, to use this as a period to give rein to those possibilities, to play with them, to even flirt with the ones that are completely unreasonable, more playful, probably things you wouldn't do, but allow you to express the parts of you that are there wanting expression. For some of us, it's uh, what a psychologist called the fertile emptiness, because for some of us, it's a very busy period of exploring lots of things. For other people, it's a more quiet, I'm gonna go out into my garden and, and, and just kind of 
allow any kind of inner business to take place. Um, but it's, it's, it's the hallmark of transition. And the key thing here is not to shortcut it because the fact that you're in it means that you're not ready yet, that the right next thing hasn't, is not nascent enough. You're not seeing that glimmer enough. And so the key is to use it to explore, use it to diverge, to be inconsistent, to be playful, and use it to also delay commitment because if, the, if, you're, if you're in it, it means you're not ready yet and the right thing hasn't come. Endings are easy to spot. You start to get clarity. You see the light at the end of the tunnel. You also start to crystallize a story that makes sense because part of what makes that middle so challenging is you've lost the plot of your life. You don't know what's happening. You know what's next. So you don't know what's significant, right? As you start to be able to tell a story that makes sense to you and to the people who have to hire you or finance you or whatever, bring you on board, as you start to crystallize it and you can say, I was doing this and then this happened and I realized I needed to do that. As that story gels, you're near the end. Now, I wanna talk about the three things you can do to help this process along. And again, remember, the idea is not to shortcut the process because there's a lot there that's happening, that's psychological, that's about you sorting out who am I and what I really want. But these are the three things I have seen generally help. First of all, it's as active a process as you can make it be. The first and crucial thing is, do you, can you experiment with some of your ideas to actually bring them to life? And each of these levers is really rooted in an aspect of identity because in changing careers, we are working our identities and, and in many ways reinventing our identities. Our identities are very rooted in what we do, not just the title, but how we spend our time habitually what we do with ourselves, that what you do day in and day out really shapes your identity. So if you want to start making changes, start considering changes, do different things. Take advantage of projects in your company, task forces, assignments. Think about things you might do outside. Can you do advisory? Can you do freelance? Can you work with friends who are, um, have a side project on a business or a research funding proposal or whatever it is? Can you uh, do volunteer work? A lot of people over this past year have been doing volunteer work that isn't necessarily their next career, but is providing them windows into things that they want to do with their time, into ways in which they can leverage their skill sets in a different context. Um, taking or giving a class. The main idea here is to be active. Use projects to test possible selves. The second lever has to do with your network because our identities are also the company that we keep. And that company we keep can be the ties that blind and bind. That is the people who pigeonhole us as we pigeonhole ourselves because they only know our historical selves. Whereas for us, who we are is those projections for the future. So how do you embed that also in a network? How do you create a network that is a mirror of your future self that helps you move into that future? And for many of the people that I have talked to in my studies, finding kindred spirits, guiding figures, mentors, role models, forming new reference groups, connecting to people going through that kind of process, reactivating ties to people you know already but haven't been in touch with, that have been dormant, all of those things to refresh your network. Again, even if it's not necessarily focused on a lead to a particular job, it really helps the thought process, it helps generate ideas, and it helps shape that kind of messy middle process. And then um, the last of the levers has to do with making sense of the experiences that you're going through and using that to feed a thought process that informs you about what you wanna do next. And here it's based on the idea that our identities are also the story you tell about who you are, who you've been, where you're going. And you know, stories are social acts. Um, we, we refine and retune a story in its telling and telling it to other people. And so we talk a lot about self-reflection, which is important, but I always put a couple of caveats on that self-reflection. First of all, create new experiences to reflect on. Don't just reflect on the past. And second, try as hard as you can to self-reflect out loud, because when you're forced to tell the story, when you're forced to tell people why you're doing something that maybe your partner thinks is ridiculous or your coworker thinks is silly, you make sense of it. You figure it out in a way that you don't necessarily in your head. It's really hard to self-reflect 
in isolation. Um, just a concluding thought with a quote I like very much from a colleague named Richard Pascali. Uh, the important thing about this process is that it's very active. It's very active, but in a kind of a self -proto fast prototyping kind of way, in an iterative way, because we know from psychology that as adults, we're much more likely to act our way into new way of thinking about ourselves, about whatever, than to think our way into a new way of acting. So it's a kind of a, a way of saying, just do it, get out there and start activating some of those possible selves. Thank you. Herminia, thank you so much for that enlightening presentation. Um, it's um, a summary of a lot of the work you've been doing. And, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to uh, bring together such diverse themes within your work uh, for a short presentation like that. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, there is going to be a lot of um, uh, uh, discussion themes coming out of this, and Herminia and I will be in discussion um, for a short while now um, to explore this. But we are, um, though for those that are watching the stream, um, we are hashtagging, uh, using the hashtag RSA work. So if you want to join in that conversation, please go ahead and do so. But for now, um, Herminia, I want to start, it off, start off by asking you what got you interested in this particular area of research in the first place. Is, is this, was it experiential? Was it fascination? Please tell us more. Yeah, it's funny. It's a really funny question because um, the answer is, is unexpected to most people. You know, I've, I've been in the same career for 30 years and I wanted to do this career probably since I was in my teens. And, and, and so it's not, it's not experiential in that sense at all. Um, it, it really came out of, I've always studied how people make transitions in their career. And I was really looking more at the transitions that we make inside a career path and inside an organization. And then I got to the late nineties and everybody was looking to figure out how to get out of what they were doing, how to make shifts. And, and, and so I shifted tracks myself and started following those stories. And I became really intrigued uh, by what I was finding. I see. I see. So you talk, you spoke a lot about um, the transition and the journey, which is fascinating. I'm sure many people um, that are watching can resonate with that to some degree, even if they haven't gone through the entire process, maybe they've, they've started it and, and not been able to continue for some reason or the other. But I wanna talk about the barriers um, that uh, you did allude to, uh, the societal barriers that uh, many people face. So if somebody wants to transition into something, either an academic field or a professional industry uh, or job, um, that's profoundly different or is seen to be profoundly different. Uh, they're often met with a kind of skepticism, aren't they? Or a kind of suspicion. And um, that kind of perception, uh, there's a whole history behind why that exists. But how does the individual, uh, over, how, how is the individual able to overcome that in the best way? Right. So there's lots of things in your question. I'll try to, I'll mm. try to pick it apart. But I think um, one of the things I talked about is our social mores have changed. And we are, with each passing year, uh, more and more accepting of people making very big changes in their career. We just see more and more people around us doing that. You know, how many people do you know who have moved into something completely different? And, and, and we're starting to have more ways of facilitating that. I mean, this, this gets back to what I talked about, that these are one of the barriers is that they're often do-it-yourself kind of changes. We don't have the institutional means. However, you know, we're starting to have more and more um, university programs, courses available, MOOCs, things that kind of give you um, the skill sets and the credentials that you need to make these changes. And so we're starting to, as a society, provide more bridges for people to make from one career to the next. Nevertheless, there are barriers and there are many careers in which you're never going to get entry at age 40 or, or, or age 50 because that's not how they work. And so part of the learning process for people is how do I marry things that are feasible and possible with things that I'm interested in and kind of making their way to those kinds of ideas is part of what makes the process take a long time. Mm, how interesting. And what about uh, this, this notion of possible selves is very, very fascinating to me because I wrote this book called The Polymath. And as you know, polymaths are inherently diverse individuals who move into different uh, fields of knowledge, uh, different professions, 
and often excel at many of them. So this, this, this possible self is really fascinating. Now, how, to what extent do, can people actually uh, explore this simultaneously? And to what extent does it need to be sort of one step at a time or one career at a time? Yeah. So again, a few, a few different things, you know, some people, you know, there are, there are polymaths out there who are able to, to just really have enormous range in the kinds of things that they do. And, um, and they're exceptional. And, um, you know, I just, I don't think we encourage enough of that. So there may be more if they had more encouragement. Um, most of the people that I have studied are not polymaths but they are much more multiple than they realize before mm. they start this process. And one of the things that is, is really interesting in this idea of possible selves, it, it by the way, comes from Hazel Marcus, a, a psychologist at Stanford, mm -hmm. is, you know, she said two important things. One is our identities are as much our projections for the future as they are our past and mm -hmm. present. And two, our identities are not coherent. Um, you know, for again, for now close to 20 years, I've been having my students make lists of the possible selves. And it is such a refreshing thing for them and such a liberating exercise because for the first time in their lives, they're not being asked, what do you want to do when you grow up or where do you see yourself five years from now? It is permission to be incoherent and divergent, which most of us are. And allowing that to happen actually gives clarity to choices that you inevitably have to make. Um, you know, I take a very Jungian view in all of this, and that is we are multiple, but the way we live our lives doesn't allow us to give rein to all of those possibilities mm -hmm. at the same time. So we make choices. And right. those choices we make carry us for a while. And after a while, those ignored possible selves are in there clamoring for attention. And right. that's right. part of what drives career change. The last thing I'll say to it is, mm -hmm. um, this kind of divergence and really playing with a lot of very different options that literally make people crazy is really productive. And they think many times, I shouldn't do anything if I don't have that clear one thing I want to explore. But in fact, not at all. That kind of divergence allows them to actually really tease out what is good for them and what's not, what's more interesting to them and what, what's not through a kind of compare and contrast of trying out these different options. Hmm. So shall we be, then be giving uh, the young graduate or even um, those that are going into university or looking at going into university, shall we be giving them, um, cutting them a little bit more slack and giving them a bit more time to find themselves? I mean, that's, that's I think that's a point of view uh, that is anchored on the idea of finding yourself, which I don't think is a really, is a really valid one. Mm. Uh, you know, I, the young people I see, they're just, you know, they're experimenting their way into new careers. You know, they, they'll major in something, but then they'll do something else. And if they don't like it, they go into a next. And so, you know, really the twenties are right now very much a very high exploration period for a lot of mm. kids. You're also seeing a lot more degrees um, that allow for that. Um, you know, uh, here in, in London, it seems like all of my friends' kids are doing a, the arts and science degree at UCL that allows people to, mm. to just kind of create a divergent portfolio of things they're studying. So we're already, we're already seeing that. Yeah. And to what extent do many of these trends that you talk about, to what extent are they applicable um, to, I guess, societies outside of Western societies. Um, are, you, are, are many of these ideas applicable, universal? Are some of them specific to certain cultural contexts? So I think what is um, variable in cultural contexts is the extent to which the idea of kind of follow your passion and change careers if it's not suitable for you is anchored in the culture or not. So it's a very US thing, the US being a, a country of immigrants, you mm -hmm. can always reinvent yourself, right? I say this as an immigrant to the United States as a child. 
There are other countries, I lived in France for a very long time. This has taken longer because in France, the ideal is you go work for the civil service and you have a stable job for life. Now that myth doesn't exist anymore anyhow. And, and lots of people are making career changes, but it has been a bit less prevalent. You know, I give talks about this in Japan in different places. It's, I think it's a universal process Mm. You will just have differences in the extent to which those social mores, those social norms are wholeheartedly supporting what you're doing or kind of urging caution and prudence and, and, and maybe not. Sure. So that's more cultural, social mores. But what about economic systems? Are there certain economic systems and paradigms that are more uh, friendly to the kind of approach or more open to the kind of approach you mentioned than others? Or is it is it pretty much the same and it's up to the individual to take that initiative? You know, in this process, you have all kinds of constraints, economic conditions, economic systems, um, the mortgage you have to pay, your kids in school, you know, there's, there's <laughs> what work your spouse does. There's all kinds of constraints. Mm. Um, but what I've seen is where there's a will, there's a way. And because the process that I describe is not a process of just kind of taking a leap into the void. It's a process of actually sticking to your day job and exploring things, building up your credentials, building up your network, building up your know-how about what you might want to go into. And when that starts to gel, then taking the leap. And you can do that under any kind of circumstances. Right. So uh, what the other question I had, I guess, was about, um, uh, of course, the future of work, uh, which has been, um, as you said, many of, many of this what you've spoken about is timeless. This approach is a timeless approach. In the future, uh, as you see, uh, as we see exponential changes in technology and indeed in society, um, to, uh, to what extent do people need to reevaluate uh, or reevaluate or go through the self-reflection that you speak about? Do you think it would need to be done more often? Will people need to reinvent themselves more often during the course of a single career? I mean, that's, that's, that is exactly what we're seeing now already. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's the interaction between longevity and, and exponential technology change. Um, you know, the nature of work is changing. What are opportunities, that new opportunities that we didn't imagine become available? Old career paths just shut down because they've been automated away. Uh, but at the same time, if you kind of believe this idea of the 100-year life that's been advanced by my colleagues, uh, Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott um, at the London Business School, you know, as we live longer, it makes no sense anymore to live this kind of stage life where we study young and then have a long stretch of a career mm -hmm. and then we retire. We're going to have much more cycles of studying, preparing, working, and then taking a pause and being able to transition in and out of those things is going to be a really valued skill set because uh, you are either going to be proactive about it or it gets forced on you. Yeah. So sadly, we'll have to wrap up now, Armenia. Thank you so much for your time. It's greatly appreciated. Your insights, uh, your wisdom on this matter is, um, is going to, I'm sure, um, get cause many people to think deeply about their own personal lives, about the lives of those that they care about, and about the world at large. Um, so thanks again. Uh, this conversation, just to remind people, is uh, part of the Polymath Festival. Uh, you'll find more information in the chat about the Polymath Festival, where there are many more talks relating to multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and the notion of these possible selves that we've been discussing uh, during this uh, talk. Thanks again, everybody, and all the best to you. Thank you, Wakas, and thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure.